with uh, next talk in the session two, advances in cattle phenotyping capabilities. The next talk will be given by uh, Isabelle Vessier on sensor technique to phenotype behavior and health. How, do, how does this work? How would I, uh, I just change this? Uh, the slides are not uh, ready. Who is putting the slides? Yes, yes. now it's okay. Thank you. So, again, good morning, everybody. I hope you had a, a nice coffee. You're fully awake now. Uh, so, in SmartCo, we um, did some work using sensor data to phenotype behavioral traits, health, and feed efficiency of cattle. The idea came from the fact that behavior is both a link between the animal and its environment, because the animal takes some food from its environment, it explores the environment, it interacts with other animals, etc. And behavior is also a manifestation of the animal's internal state. So far, it was uh, quite uh, difficult or time consuming to uh, record behavioral data because we had to observe directly the animals. Nowadays, there are lots of sensors that you could put on the neck of animals, on their legs, on their ears. You can look at their position in a barn or in a field, etc. Thanks to the development of precision livestock farming tools, especially. Just a minute, because uh, online they, they cannot see the slide. <laughs> uh, okay. So it's okay now. It's okay. So uh, we wondered whether we could process those data from sensors to detect states such as sickness behavior, stress, estrus, calving of cows, and also if we could predict more complex traits such as efficiency and sensitivity to health disorders. So first, we um, um, identified a number of descriptors that we could use on those usually 24 uh, hours time series of data that are provided by sensors, because of course they allow to have data every hours or sometime every second on an animal for very long periods. Usually the manufacturers, they propose something like in this pie, uh, that is the proportion of time spent by an animal in different activities. So this is from the uh, time domain that is, is based on the duration of activities. In this domain, we also developed indicators such as activity level by combining different um, data. And it gives us an idea of how much a cow is active uh, we uh, developed also indicators like minimum or maximum activity distribution during the day with different, uh, different calculations. We also explore descriptors in the frequency domain. The frequency domain is based on how frequent an activity is observed during the day or over several days. So it can be addressed by calculating autocorrelations. We developed a specific indicator for non-periodicity of activity, which is the difference between the actual activity of the animal and the correlogram obtained by autocorrelations. We also used Fourier transform which is a, a traditional way to uh, analyze uh, data in the frequency domain. And then we uh, asked two main questions. The first one was, can we identify stable traits? So can we phenotype the behavior of an animal, especially in relation to animal efficiency or sensitivity to disease. So we look at the animal for a certain period of time and we try to predict what the animal will be after that. And we also investigate ways to monitor uh, the uh, behavior of animals and to detect events from this monitoring. Uh, we try to detect the occurrence of stress, disease, estrus, or calving. Regarding phenotyping, um, so two traits were much more investigated, so efficiency. 
we used data from feed beans, as in this uh, picture, uh, give, uh, gives the weight of the beans every second, and then we can uh, decide, or well, calculate how much the animal has eaten and the speed of eating, etc. And we used uh, um, an indicator of feed efficiency, which was quite basic. We used energy corrected milk divided by intake. And we observed that 27 of the percentage of the variability of feed efficiency could be explained by behavior, especially by eating rate and the variation of the number of feed bin visits, the variation from one day to another. And the prediction was not increased when we used also activity, uh, data from activity measures like lying, uh, standing, walking, etc. So the conclusion was that the slower the cow eats and the more variable its fre uh, feeding frequency, the more efficient the cow is. A second result that I will present today is um, based on the use of activity methods to determine how much a cow is uh, walking, resting, standing during the day. And we try to predict the um, health of the cow after calving. So the behavior was recorded for six weeks before calving, and after calving, the health of the cow was checked by clinical observations and also by several biological assays. And we calculated a total deficit score, so higher, the higher the score, the poorer the health. We observed that 38% of the variability in that total deficit score was explained by the non-periodicity of standing up events, essentially, and also the cyclic component of time spent standing, and to a lesser extent on time spent inactive. So here we see that the more a cow shows cyclic patterns of activity during the day before calving, the better it helps after calving. Now we move to the monitoring of uh, the behavior to detect events in real time. Uh, last year I presented results where we could detect change, changes in the activity rhythm. Uh, and we saw that those changes were to health problems or stress or calving or oestrus. But we could not distinguish between these states. Now we um, investigated more this uh, type of data. So we use now uh, 21 pictures describing the distribution of activity of a cow during the day. So on the top left, you have a very uh, simplified uh, graph showing the level of activity of a cow for two days. So it's low during at night, it's high during daytime. And uh, also had information provided by caretakers about the uh, state of the cow or about something that happened in the barn, like some handling or mixing of the animals. We put that um, in an algorithm. We used machine learning, a Rodham Forest algorithm here. And by doing so, we are now able to distinguish the different um, states of the animal. So on the um, left part of the, you have the confusion matrix between the uh, true um, state of the animal as reported by caretakers and the state of the animal predicted by the algorithm. On the diagonal, you can see that the, there is a match between 20 and 40% of cases, which doesn't seem to be very much, but here we consider any 24 hours time series around a specific event. You can see on the left, the uh, cells which are a bit in yellow, that uh, the confusion is often with control days, with something uh, with a day not, well, nothing was recorded by the caretakers. And if we consider whether we can detect at least one series correctly during an episode around a given event, because usually we, we consider several days before and after, 
is uh, the performance of the classification reaches 100% in most cases. And if we do the same one day before, that is, for instance, one day before a mastitis is uh, reported by a caretaker or oestrus or calving or uh, um, uh, lameness, then the, uh, the performance is still good because uh, nearly two-thirds of calving are detected the day before. Uh, no, two-thirds uh, two of oestrus and nearly 100% for the other uh, states. So we were very pleased of those results. So now we can not only detect, but also uh, discriminate between cow states. Uh, and we can do that one or two days before it is detected by caretakers. The impacts of those results, first for infrastructures, we uh, can now extract more information from sensor data than uh, what is proposed by the manufacturers. Uh, we have access to traits which would be difficult to uh, assess by direct observations like activity reasons or regularity of the activity. So this kind of calculations can be um, provided to uh, people using the infrastructures for academics, uh, an important result was that the cyclic patterns of activities seem crucial to ensure a good animal functioning. Uh, also for academics, uh, now those data from census are available more or less for free, so we don't always need to run an experiment. We can use data which are available, so it's very uh, important for research and it avoids using animals. And of course, for the industry, the two main impacts are the phenotyping, which, is, which can be improved by using data on animal behavior. And for uh, people developing precision livestock farming systems, uh, it will be um, very interesting to enrich those systems to early identify different states of uh, the cows. So the phenotyping is more for strategic management and the monitoring and precision livestock farming is more for the day-to-day -day management, so the operational management. But we continue working on these data. Uh, we want to explore um, all the descriptors of time series. Uh, because uh, at present we consider that it, it was more or less symmetric, the activity between the day and at night, but we know that it's not exactly like that in real life. So we, we are exploring wavelets and topographic descriptors. Uh, we thought that it was when Caretexas noticed something on the uh, logbook, it is more or less a yes or no um, uh, differentiation, but we know that the behavior of an animal will change progressively before the order happens, and it will again uh, resume normal states progressively afterwards. So rather than uh, using uh, a clear distinction between states, we want to use fuzzy logic to the labeling of uh, the time series, though so we have started, and it seems to improve the uh, discrimination of states. And we are also to analyze precisely the feeding behavior of animals because for the moment we only took into account the amount of food eaten, the regularity of meals or the, um, the uh, eating rate. But we want to distinguish the um, time spent by a cow taking a bite versus chewing that bite. And we want to relate that to feed efficiency. And I thank you for your attention. So thank you, Isabel, for this uh, very comprehensive talk about what was done on sensor data during the SmartCo project. I see a first question in the chat from Pascal Salvetti. Uh, thank you for your talk, Isabel, each sensor are different and the manufacturers don't allow an access to raw data, but only to their own elaborated data. It could be a problem for animal phenotyping and establishment of proxies in, for animal selection. How overcome this problem? 
uh, having a contract with a manufacturer, I would say. <laughs> well, I think uh, that's what we, we had in our infrastructures because we are experimental farms, so we can discuss and agree with the manufacturers to have more information because in return we will provide them with uh, methods to uh, refine their calculations. So it's a win-win uh, uh, strategy. Then uh, I hope in the future they will include what we propose as a service. And uh, yes, and that's it. Yes. Kenny? Thanks, Isabel. Um, I'm wondering in relation to the machine learning work, whether you've considered just training the algorithm on the raw data rather than on the particular features? It sounded like oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're giving see. the yeah, algorithm and, and the... Unsupervised uh, machine learning, yeah. yeah. It would, well, we that haven't would, that explored would everything, but yeah. that, that's an idea also. Yeah, I agree. Are there other questions? Right. For those who are not in this area, I mean, you, when you do machine learning, you can uh, define classes and you try to match the classes with uh, the output of the machine learning, or you ask the algorithm to make, um, to differentiate classes without any, uh, any information on what those classes should be. And, yeah, because two states might be very similar, so I agree that. Yeah. Uh, there is another question in the chat from uh, Nicola Frigans. Uh, you raise the real issue that the observations that we use to validate fe precision phenotypes are usually poorer mm. than the precision of the technologies uh, and being tested. Do you see ways of dealing with this? I mean, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. That is that. Ah, okay. Yeah, the, the yeah a major issue is that you have you should be sure of the gold standard you use. Here we used the information provided by caretakers. But maybe they missed a few things, or they misinterpreted things. Uh, so it's always difficult. You, you, uh, you're never sure of your gold standard. But uh, the, um, it can, I think it can be compensated by the large amount of data we obtain. There are errors. It's quite inevitable, but if you have Many, many, many data, and with that you you can uh, we we had we use data set with uh, uh, 500 cows for several years. So even if there are errors, at the end of the day, uh, it might be not a big problem. Um, okay, so there is now there is. A Two questions in the room, and I see two questions in the chat, and I think we will stop after that. So uh, please, short question. <laughs> short question, okay. Uh, before we discussed that uh, one or uh, that more than one proxy could be helpful to explain uh, a phenotype, do you think uh, it could be also helpful to have information from more than one uh, sensor to, to have uh, uh, better information on the, on the status of, of the animals? For example, not only using activity sensors, but also rumination sensors, pH sensors, and something like that, and integrate all this information? Yeah, pro probably, probably it, it, it should increase the precision, definitely. But we, we haven't explored that yet. Yes, this is also part of my question about uh, biological factors and uh, feeding factors. Uh, when you show uh, uh, in the first slide when, uh, the cor negative correlation between rate of intake or feeding behavior and uh, efficiency, mm -hmm. uh, did you observe this kind of correlation, whatever the kind of diet or not? Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you have grass-based grass diet, the rate of intake is very slow and probably the difference mm -hmm. between the two are very slow. Mm -hmm. uh, in very high-rate diet as maize silage 
the same, but uh, and it could be different for the hay diet, for example. Yeah, so definitely. I think there is a, a mm. because we we observe in the past. I observe in the past that uh, the rate of intake of the animals is also explained by the ability of the animal to fill rapidly and uh, in a huge manner its rumen. Mm. Mm. Uh, so after we have Mar difference in digestibility and efficiency. <laughs> so I think the 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 diet was a. Uh, yeah. Diets are mainly TMRs, uh, not grazing animals, were in, in this analysis, and may, based in maize silage and ryegrass silage. So, yeah. The, there were not differences, in, big differences in, in the diets of the data used for this analysis. Okay. Uh, there is a follow up question from Nicola Frigens. How do we move vets and over to accept that they are shade of gray in health and welfare states? Cows are not either sick or healthy. Cow can be in between. Yeah, in between. <laughs> but I, I don't. What kind of answer can I? I think it's maybe more a comment. Yeah, it's a comment. <laughs> Thank and, you, Nicola. Uh, a final question. Uh, about uh, an important question, I think. Do you think this sensor could be used for extensive farming? Not only indoor, for extensive farming, there are some limitations regarding battery life, message size, and so on. Uh, but I think and, things, things are moving quickly in that area. And there, there are now sensors which can be used uh, in extent, well, first outdoors. Uh, it's already used outdoors. And also for extensive system, there, there are there are um, sensors that use um, little energy and with a lower uh, network and so on. While it, there are many technical things nowadays. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, everybody, for the question and Isabel for your nice answers.